the cost of storing this data has dramatically gone down. Today, with $3,000, you could store every single book that was written in human history, something that would have cost us $1 billion back in 1984. The processing power that we need in order to process this data also has dramatically gone down. Today, in your smartphone, you not only have more power than the computer that put the first man on the moon, but actually more power than all mainframes that NASA had during that time. Your Xbox at home has more processing power than a supercomputer that NSA bought that cost $67 million back in 96. All of us are part of this big data ecosystem. Every time you make a search, every time you buy something, every time you take a look at a recommendation, we are consuming and we are also contributing to data. And from my talk in the, in the good, bad, and the ugly, this is the good part. The, real data, the big data power is real. But with the hype, a lot of times there's a lot of confusion. Uh, Dan Ariely, who is a professor of behavioral economics, actually says this very clear. And I quote, big data is like teenage sex. Everybody talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everybody thinks everyone else is doing it, so everybody claims they're doing it. <laughs> I don't think I could have been more clear on that one. So today what we're going to be talking about is the five myths on, of big data. And we'll start with the first one. What really matters is the size of data. Everybody talks about size of data, size of data. Well, the other day I was at a conference of, of big data, and one of the speakers was presenting his use of data. And, and this was a very interesting use of data. But someone from the audience claimed, well, this is not really big data because you could store this in a single server. Apparently, that's the definition. Well, I'm gonna, the poor speaker didn't know how to answer. I'm going to try to answer for, for him. We need enough data to solve a problem, but we need to focus on the problem. Let's not focus on the size of data by itself. And let me give you two examples that I think that are very important. First one is Nate Silver. So Nate Silver became famous after rightly predicting the last two presidential elections, not only at the country level, but also at the state level. Well, if you take a look at his approach that is extremely intelligent, the data that he used can fit today in your smartphone. Even you can run his models in your smartphone today. But one thing that is even more interesting is Netflix. Netflix is one of the flagships of big data. At peak time, Netflix generates one third of the internet traffic, mainly from streaming. So they can generate a huge amount of data. But if you really think what's the success story of Netflix, of the use of big data, is the recommendation engine. Well, a few years ago, Netflix opened a competition to improve the recommendation engine and allow different teams across the world to download the training set. The whole training set was 32 gigs. And once you remove unnecessary information to train the model, you could use roughly five gigs. Again, you could store this in your smartphone. It's true that some of these problems will require a huge amount of data, but we need enough data to solve that problem, and we need to focus on the problem. Given that everyone else is creating their own words these days, I'm going to try my first one here. So I'm proposing the word that is big data but with W. And this stands with big impact with data. And this is what we should focus. Myth number two. In order to do data science or big data, all I need is Hadoop or other technologies. Don't get me wrong. Hadoop is a great piece of technology. It allows you to store a huge amount of data in a distributed way. It allows you to use commodity hardware. Not only that, it has a map reduce engine. It allows you to process this data. But its infrastructure is not magic. Hadoop by itself is useless until, unless you have people like data scientists looking at the data and actually getting value out of data. If you take a look at today, the majority of the investment that we see is mainly 
on the infrastructure side. Everybody talks, let's build this new cluster, let's build this new Hadoop cluster, let's have no SQL. Everybody is focused on infrastructure. Well, I can tell you that the difficult part is not building the infrastructure. The, if, the difficult part on any big data project is actually getting value out of this data. So my take is that if we don't focus, if we don't balance the investment, we will not get ROI from these projects. ROI from any big data project comes from what you do with the data, comes from the insights, comes from the models. Myth number three. Big data means the end of scientific theories. In 2008, Chris Anderson, who was at that point the chief editor of Wire magazine, wrote a very interesting article called The End of Theory. In the article, he claimed that, well, with, new with, with the amount of new data and with the processing power, the whole idea of hypothesis testing is, no lo is becoming obsolete. He claims that because we have a huge amount of data, correlation supersedes causation. And because now you have petabytes of information, numbers speak for themselves. There's a joke out there that for us data scientists that if you need the word scientist in your title it's because you're not one of them. Well, I can tell you and I can guarantee that if we believe that theory is no longer needed and numbers will speak for themselves, they are right. So I'm gonna to try to explain in two, two of the main things from the article. I disagree with Chris Anderson on this. The first one is, is really correlation enough? And the second one is, is really the scientific method obsolete? So I'm trying to, got this, try to set the record straight here. Science is not about finding, only about finding patterns. I agree with Chris Anderson on that one that now with a huge amount of data and a huge amount of processing power, Finding patterns, finding correlations is easier. But that's ju just part of this. Really, science is the explanation of these patterns. Proving causality and understanding the cause. Finding correlation is easy. Finding causation, that's the difficult part. Correlation does not imply causation. Not because two variables are correlated, you can explain that one explains the other one. And let me show you two examples. How many of you know the there's a correlation with the size of your hand. The bigger the hand, the less amount of years you will live. For those who thought that having bigger hands was a good thing. Well, the reason this happens is because on average, women have smaller hands compared to men, and on average, they live longer. Once you have the information together, you see a correlation. Nothing to do with the size of your hand. Another, a little more interesting correlation, there's a correlation between the cell phones that a country has and the CO2 emissions. And this type of correlations, by the way, is very useful because if tomorrow you need to calculate or estimate the CO2 emissions of a particular country and you cannot calculate that by just knowing the number of cell phones, you can use this model to estimate it. So from that perspective, it's useful. But this doesn't explain that well, cell phones are the cause of CO2 emissions. If tomorrow I'm a president of a country and based on this I decide to ban cell phones, probably parents will stop complaining that their kids are, are on the cell phones all the time. But in reality, the CO2 emissions will remain exactly the same. Again, correlation does not imply causation. No matter how much data or processing power we have. The second thing is, is really the scientific method obsolete? If you take a look at the scientific method, it's the idea of you have a hypothesis, you run an experiment, and you can prove basically whether the hypothesis is correct. Well, the, the gold standard to prove causality on experiments is running randomized control experiments. What is this? You take a, look, a group of people, you divide this group into two randomly selected groups, and you apply the hypothesis to one of them, and then you measure. If there is a statistical significance between the two, you can prove the that the cause of that delta was the factor that you introduced. That's the power of running control experiments. In computer science, we call this A-B testing. If you go today to Bing, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, any of these big organizations, 
you are part of thousands of experiments. Actually, running control experiments at that massive level is probably one of the most successful stories of big data. A data scientist in these organizations run more experiments in a month than a lot of scientists will run in their lifetime. So to the contrary, we're, we're, it's not only not obsolete, today's scientific method is more used than ever before in history. Myth number four, data scientists are always right. We are not right, unfortunately not. George Box, who was a very famous statistician, said once, all mothers are wrong, but some are useful. And he was right. Majority of the things that we do as data scientists is to prove causality. Well, there, there are two major ways to do it. If you can run a control experiment, this is the gold standard of, of, of proving causality. A lot of times, unfortunately, we cannot run control experiments. So we try to infer causality, use what is called an observational study. You find a correlation, you find a pattern, and you try to infer causality based on this data. Unfortunately, a lot of times this goes wrong. And I'm going to show you what I call the left-handed dilemma. If we assume that in this room today, there's the left, being left-handed in this room is independent of being in this room, then the distribution of left-handed people today is roughly the same as the distribution of left-handed in the world. Means that 10% of you will be left-handed. Can you raise your hand if you're left-handed? No, not bad. <laughs> well, I have a terrible news for you left-handed people. In 1991, Corrin and Halpern from State, uh, California State University and San Bernardino and University of British Columbia did a very famous research. They took a, a group of people that died and asked their family members whether they were left-handed or right-handed. What they discovered was amazing. Left-handed people would die nine years earlier than right-handed people. Really bad. This research was published in one of the most prestigious medical journals, that is the New England Journal of Medicine. It was cited and referenced by many other authors. It was even in the New York Times. Just to be clear, if this was right, being left-handed was as bad as smoking 120 cigarettes per day. <laughs> well, the good news for left-handed, not for these guys, was that there was a big flaw on the way that they approached the problem. They assumed that the percentage of left-handed people was the same over the years. And this was not right. And the reason this was not right is for a long time, there was sort of a discrimination, I guess, against left-handed people. People were forced to be right-handed. My grandfather was one of them. And these introduced a bias, in, introduced an, in, an artificial increase in left-handed people over the years. And this bias actually produced this artifact that you see that left-handed people die younger, when in reality, that's not the fact. But again, things can go wrong. Jim Muncy that did a, a, a research call and control. Take a look at all the observational studies, whether they were, you could be reproducible or not. Means that you could run it many times and have the same results. Only 20% of the observational studies could be reproduced, compared to 90% from the randomized control experiments. What I think is really important here is to understand that whenever you are reading something, whenever you're understanding a research, we need to understand how did we get there? Did we, is this an, an insight based on a control experiment or an observational study? Was this reproducible or not? Because they're not the same. And this is, you open a newspaper today and you'll find thousands of these examples, like wine is good, Coffee is bad. All these are observational studies. People take a look at an observation, and then they assume causality, when in reality, majority of them will be wrong. In God we trust, all others must bring reproducible research. That's what we need to live on. Myth number five, the last one today. Big data can solve world hunger. Well, not really. 
but at least the good news is it can help. Today, 40% of the food produced in the US goes uneaten. And this is not only a $165 billion problem, it's much worse than that. We are using, we are using natural resources to generate this food and not really using it. All these uneaten food end up in landfills. And in these landfills, they generate methane. Well, methane is 31 times worse for global warming compared to CO2. So all these 40% of food that goes there represents roughly 25% of, of cars. The same pollution, basically. Well, if you think, what was the last time this happened to you, that you throw away uneaten food, usually the number one cause is because we make a bad prediction. We are buying more food than the one that we can use. Well, reality is that this not only happens at the last mile, it actually happens in e each one of these individual stem steps through the food chain. There's people making a prediction how much food I'm going to sell. One every seven trucks that goes into the supermarket with perishable food will end up uneaten. One every seven trucks. They will not even sell that food to you. So what I'm saying is that if we can improve those predictions, if we can have better information to have a better prediction, then we can at least help solve part of this problem. If we have, even at the, at the agriculture level, if we have better weather prediction, if we have better soil information, we can use this information to better use natural resources. What I'm trying to show here is that there are a lot of very important problems that with the good use of data and data science, we can try to help. So what, we do, so what we do, we do, did we see today? First, what really matters is the impact you can get with data. Don't focus just on the size of data. Technologies like Hadoop or any other, NoSQL or whatever, can help and they're part of infrastructure. But without data science, we will not get any value out of them. And the difficult part is getting value out of them. Scientific theory is today more relevant than ever. So whoever tells you that theory is no longer important doesn't really understand the power of ran randomized control experiments. There are a lot of very important problems out there that can be solved using data. In your smartphone today, you have more processing power than the one that was used to put a man on the moon. There's a lot of important problems out there that can be solved and needs to be solved using data and data science. You no longer have excuses. Thank you very much.